Warhammer 40,000 Chaos Gate Demon Hunter comes out tomorrow, and in this video today, we're going to go over my top tips for beginners to help you break down the learning curve of the game. Chaos Gate is an expansive, dense game covering tons of little factoids, lore bits, and grueling face smashing in the name of the Emperor. With that being said though, there are still some bits of crucial information that are nested behind a few screens or tricks that I picked up after my first 10 or 20 hours in the game. I hope to crack that sack of secrets open, like popping into Papa Nurgle's bag of tricks and pulling out some of the most disgusting plagues possible. Some of these tips will be presented to you in the tutorial, but I feel like the explanation is a bit weak, leaving you kind of calling out, I am pinned here, battle brother! So allow me to guide you like the Astronomicon. If you'd like to jump ahead to any specific tip that interests you the most, you can find all of them in the chapters listed in the timeline and the description. If you're worried about spoilers, don't worry, we won't be looking at any critical points in the game, just an upfront disclaimer there. But before we get started, if you intend on picking up Chaos Gate Demon Hunters and would like to support the channel, you can use the link to my Nexus store in the description and pinned comment. Nexus works directly with the developer, getting Steam keys to you, while also giving me a cut of every sale that helps keep the channel alive. And also, if you end up enjoying the video, don't forget to comment, like, or subscribe. This helps root out heresy in all of its forms for the good of the Imperium. But let's get started on our beginner tips for Chaos Gate Demon Hunter. And our first tip actually brings us to the options menu. So one thing that I really like to take a look at is settings whenever I boot up a brand new game. And a lot of stuff is nestled pretty well here in the general tab, stuff like the combat events and ship events. These two are pretty cool. So throughout the game, if you start to really get sick of seeing all these little events, you can turn them down to never or always, or some things like the cinematic subtitles, you can turn that off here. This expands into stuff like graphics, interface, these things that if you're playing on the actual battlefield and it looks really cluttered, you can turn a lot of them off right here. And this is huge. But really, the big help of this menu is the codex. This is going to give you all of the breakdown of every single little thing in the game that the tutorial does not go over or the tooltip maybe doesn't expand on 100%. Stuff like, oh, say, if you go through afflictions, and you go through something like hobbled. Okay, well this afflicted target suffers minus two move speed or plagued, something that you'll get in the very early portion of the game. Afflicted target suffers two damage every turn. So these things are really great ways to get a little bit of insight onto some of the stuff that's happening in the game that you maybe just don't know what the hell it means. Stuff like the key concepts, like what auto means or what a body type is. Stuff like the damage reduction from cover, distance, stuff like that. These are all things that are not directly explained in the game. And it took me going through a lot of this to find out what a lot of it actually meant. Our second quick tip is about right-clicking to quickly move through nested menus. Here's an example of this. So we're going to go to the barracks. We're going to click on a random knight. We're going to go to loadout and then armor type and then power armor. Now, normally you would think you just have to go down here to go back then press here to go back. You don't have to do that. You can just simply right-click and you'll jump to the previous menu no matter where you are in the game and what you're doing. Anytime a menu pops up, you simply right click. It just makes navigating everything way easier than having to go, okay, press back here. Okay, now press back down there. All right, uh, uh, then click that, click this, then press back, then press back. You just right click and you're automatically going to wherever you need to go. And like I said, this works with any menu in the game. As long as you go there, you'll find it. Just right click and go back and forth. It is huge and it has saved me a lot of time because I was so frustrated having to bring my cursor down to the corner to press back or press X somewhere to close a menu wherever it was. This one is a time saver. Now, another quick tip is about moving your units before you reveal enemies. So whenever you reveal enemies in the game, it starts what's called the start combat phase. And when that happens, it's going to reset all of the action points of your units as well as reload all of their ammunition so this is really cool but if you sit there and you know that there's going to be a unit right here and you move just one person forward and you have units all the way back here and they can't really help out it kind of puts you at a disadvantage so what i would recommend is getting your other units closer so that they don't reveal the enemy but it allows you to get them in a position that when the enemy is revealed you're going to be able to take far more advantage out of that brand new set of movement points and of reloaded action so let's go ahead and push our guy right here that should reveal everyone they're looking great looking absolutely 
romantic in their attire. Now, the enemy will get a movement, so you don't want to move anyone too far forward. But now I'm in a position here where I could have done any kind of overwatching or anything like that on any of these other more close units to have them get an advantage here and get a little extra shot in. But as you can see, everyone's action points are now brought back to max and they can take advantage of the fact that now we know where the enemy is exactly and I can move units around to start getting or taking advantage of this. And you do want to be kind of mindful of it. You can you saw that little icon here earlier. It had a directional symbol. So if we took too long doing this, the enemy would have moved this direction. So you do have to kind of set up quite quickly, but this allows you to put yourself in a much better position to take advantage of revealing the enemy, assessing their strength, getting all of your action points and not having any one of your demon hunters so far removed from the group that they either get ambushed and killed or they're so far back that they can't actually help out your other demon hunters. The unit info card is our next tip and it is a pretty big one. The game does instruct you on how to find it, but I don't really think it goes through a lot of the nuance that you can find in this bad boy. So if you hover over any enemy or any friendly unit, you'll see this little I. You can also consequently just press I on the keyboard and it brings up the unit info card here. Now this is where we're gonna get a ton of really important information. You can see active abilities that the unit has, any passive abilities that are currently active, any auto abilities, these would be abilities that would trigger when certain Certain things happen. Here's an example of one. If I go over to my, there we go, my just a car. If I go over to auto abilities, you can see this would be something that says, "Hey, when an enemy moves adjacent to this unit, they have a 25% chance to be struck automatically." That would be an auto ability. And then lastly, you also have any kind of armaments that your unit or um, your enemy has. So gray knight enemy, whatever you want to take a look at. But what you also get here that's really important when you're taking a look at it from an enemy standpoint is all this juicy information right here. I can see their armor, how far they can move, which gives me an idea of what the threat range is, their um, crit vulnerability, as well as their resistance, any seeds if they have them, which is really crucial to all of your upgrading and research process, their, whether or not they're demonic, mechanical, or, or organic, which will dictate what their vulnerabilities are like, their stun, as well as their hit points. These are all crucial bits of information that the game doesn't really give you a good idea on the fact that you should be looking at this or the mutations over here so maybe if you hit a certain point and the bloom triggers a warp surge and they get mutated well here are the list of mutations that they can possibly get and this will be different for every unit to, i'm sorry enemy enemy type in the game so you'll find that some of them will not just simply give two armor it'll give them something different or something whatever it is across the, the gamut and any mutations that are active we'll go over here you'll see them filled in like that. So this is, oh, plus two hit points to this guy. Also, you can see any status effects. So this is a very powerful screen that the game kind of makes you think is not as important, but in fact, you will be spending a good amount of time here for any brand new enemy you come across to better understand how to fight them, how quick they're gonna move, what their abilities are like, even, you know, what their passives are or maybe what their armaments are especially when you start to fight a lot of the demons in the game this is going to be a very 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 helpful screen to help you get through it now another concept i really want to go into is stunning the game doesn't really give you much information on this in fact it just tells you hey stun that thing and you don't really know how to do it because the game doesn't lay this out for you so if you hover over this again we'll go back to the unit card just to make it a little bit easier and better presentation if you see this up here it's their stun vulnerability basically you hover over this and it says as the number of hits the unit can take before it becomes stunned. This is not hit points. Three hit points are not going to make the unit become stunned. It has to take three separate hits. And this will then have it so that stun targets will always take a critical hit on the next attack against them and can be executed if they have a valid target point. Meaning that when you jump into a critical hit and you go to look at the actual precision targeting, if they have a valid point that allows you to execute them, you kill them outright and it will probably give you an extra um, willpower or action point depending on what your character is and what have you. So this thing is pretty crucial, especially as you go to fight harder demons and bosses, because the game doesn't really give you this distinction until you jump into that unit card. And if you look at some things, here, let me look at something that's, I can't kill out, right? Here, you can see that, and that just doesn't tell you much, right? And you see this guy, and you go, okay, well, what does that two mean? Well, this is gonna tell me that I'm gonna take away one of his hits. He's gonna have two more hits until he will be stunned. 
uh, subsequently making him far easier to critically hit, well, auto-critical hit, and then do precision targeting. When you fight bosses, that is going to be the, the make or break it point for you because you'll be able to shut down the ability of bosses by precision targeting a certain thing so they maybe can't spawn more Nurglings or whatever it is. This is a crucial point in the game that the game doesn't really illustrate until much further out that you can take advantage of in the very beginning, as you should. Aboard the Baleful Edict, we can have a conversation about abilities because there's some quick little context clues that are hidden in the actual icons as well as stuff like talents that the game doesn't really tell you about. So let's go ahead and click abilities here and we can see all the different icons for the abilities and then all the different upgrades or disciplines. You can see them grouped together up here. The scouring discipline, the iron arm discipline, the warp speed the battlefield medicine upgrades, whatever it is. So if you want to, say, have an apothecary that is geared more towards healing, you can jump into the battlefield medicine upgrades. Or maybe you want to use one that's, uh, let's see, uh, warp speed. So this has got a bunch of different things for the actual warp speed biomancy psychic boon. So whatever you want to cater your specific Grey Knight to, you can do using these abilities. Now, all these icons also give us a little bit of a context clue as to what's going on. The circular ones are any kind of passive abilities. Then the circular ones with little arrows, like this one, is any kind of auto ability. Again, an ability that will trigger whenever a certain set of criteria is met. Now, there are two other icons, these squares with the cutoff corners, and then these squares with the convex corners. They are two different types of upgrades, bonuses, abilities, whatever it is. If it's a square icon, it's typically something rooted in the physical world. The Storm Bolter, for example, is a physical um, weapon versus this guy right here is a psychic ability. The Scouring has a psychic blast right here. If I look over here, this is the Iron Arm Biomancy, which is a psychic boon. And then if I look at this, it is an upgrade to a psychic boon. Now, the game does seem to have times where this doesn't make much sense, like Overwatch over here has what looks like it would be a psychic ability, but it is not. So it has that icon for some reason. I do not know why, but for most of the time, if it has an icon like this, it is usually a psychic ability. If it has an icon like this, it is usually something grounded in some sort of physicality. Now, outside of that, you also get a talent. Every single knight that you recruit using requisition has a random talent. Sometimes those talents will repeat themselves, but it's kind of like an additional little bonus that helps color or at least give you a direction for the abilities of your specific gray knight. So you can see here that this apothecary has demon bane, giving him a crit chance against anyone that has a the demonic body type. So if we also go back here, we'll go to a different knight, We'll go to abilities. You can see that he has this Aegis Adept. Another one, abilities. This is Omnisaya's Chosen. And usually you can see them here in passive abilities. Sometimes for some reason it doesn't appear, but if I go over here, there you go, Deathless. We'll go back to just one more. Here's Resilient. So these little tiny talents are something that is unique to that specific Grey Knight. And it's something that the game doesn't really tell you about. But it, like I said, it can sometimes give you a direction for how to build out the abilities of that character. Because you maybe want to benefit what that talent actually gives them. And it is a huge, awesome, cool way to have every single knight have at least some sort of little uniqueness about them. Outside of abilities, you will be spending a lot of time in the Baleful Edict in the Prognosticar, as this is going to allow you to really kind of move around the map. So from here, you can see that we've got three missions active right now. And there's a lot of information about the game, or that the game does not really tell you about these individual missions. So if I take a look at this one, and I just press the I, it tells me I've got 12 days left. It, it, that's all it really gives you. It doesn't give you an idea of how fast you move between locations and stuff like that. It just kind of gives you a blanket. You move at 100% speed, 120% speed, whatever current technology you've researched or ship upgrades and whatever current events would then dictate your ship speed. There's be certain things that will hobble your, your ship's speed. So right now, like we're working on warp drive and that'll increase us by 20%. It takes me three days to go from here to there. How do I know that? I did it and then reloaded the game to take a look to see how long it takes. There's no indication of how long this is going to take, which is a frustrating thing in the game. But at least you have an idea of what percentage is going to be left after you 
proceed to move there. Now you can use the Prognosticar's bonus to reduce corruption, help give you an idea of what enemies will be in the location, and it will give a Bloom mission deadline increase by three days. So this tells me that this standard would have been 11 days left. With this bonus, it gives me 14 days left. Same thing over here, if I click on this one, it's got 12 days. Had that bonus been present, it would have been 15 days. And I've already activated or attuned my Prognosticar, which you can see here is active right now. If I right click this, I can tell which ones are actually attuned by the thick band that then tethers each location. See, as whereas these are kind of a lower opacity and wispy looking. Now, another big thing too to look at, if I click on this location, is the corruption level. So because the corruption is at corruption one, if we press this, it tells me that the mutation level is low, but the warp surge risk has been increased by 5% because of that corruption level. So corruption is huge because as this goes up, it will exponentially get harder and harder until it gets all the way to full corruption, in which case missions, if I remember correctly, will no longer spawn. Now, the danger level is now increased too because it is higher corruption. Now, not all mission rewards will reduce that corruption. You might have to attune the prognostic card here to reduce it. And corruption is going to be something that you're constantly fighting against. In the beginning of the game, if you look at some of these, they're, okay, this has got zero corruption. Fighting it is not going to change the corruption. Or one over here, this one's got one corruption, fighting it is going to reduce that corruption. So you want to be mindful of this to try to at least keep as many planets as you can on a baseline level of corruption, or else this will get away from you and you're going to be really fighting some hard fights as you progress into the mid to late game when everything is just stacked up in its corruption, meaning that they're going to have a lot more mutations, warp surges are going to happen way more often, creating a lot more random aspects of the game. Also, just one clack, one little uh, final thing here is just keep in mind any of the rewards that you are getting from any missions before you head over there, weighing which ones you maybe want to go for more. Like, you know, I don't really need tier one power armor or another apothecary, but I'd really like this one that's going to give me my nicer Terminator armor. This is going to give me a rank three Justicar. So weigh these bonuses or these rewards before you make these decisions because if I click over here, I'm definitely not going to be able to make it back to this one at the very least. Maybe not this one, depending on if this warp drive finishes, if I complete other upgrades during the process. So while it is frustrating, you don't know how many days it's going to take to get to a location. You can at least try to weigh which locations to go to by clicking and seeing these little bars appear. The red obviously is the travel time. Green is going to be how much time is remaining on each mission before you travel to each one, kind of weighing every single one of them out. This screen is going to be one you're going to spend a lot of time in, and this will change actively as you go to each mission because you're going to be upgrading things in the process, right? If I click this button right here, I can get an entire breakout of what that timeline looks like for any kind of repairs, any kind of wound recovery or research, maybe big points of the game or, or bonuses that are currently uh, pushing against me, how long they stay active, they'll always be at the bottom here, uh, so on and so forth. So you'll find a lot of juicy information in the screen and you're gonna be spending a lot of time here anyway. Now my last tip here is for the post battle screen. And even though we're at the post battle screen, what I'm about to talk about will be important at the end of every single one of your missions. So every single night as they come out of the mission, they're either gonna be lightly wounded, wounded, heavily wounded, or maybe just battle ready, maybe they're dead, whatever it is. But you can offset the amount of wounded that your knight is by making sure you heal them up before the mission ends. A lot of the times in the early portions of the game, you'll be dealing with missions that allow you to have a uh, extraction that is a teleportation. They'll just teleport out of the mission. So if you make sure to time it so that you have a knight that is fully healed up, like this apothecary here, by the end of the mission, he will be battle ready for the next one. As you can see, these three guys still sustain quite a bit of damage with these two over here sustaining a lot more than this guy right here. You can tell because this is a 48 day versus the 56 day on the wound. And there's um, 
severity of wounds as well, right? Lightly wounded, wounded, heavily, so on and so forth. So trying to make sure your knights are healed before the battle ends actually makes it so that you can have them in more missions or at least have them have less max hit point reduction by having a lower wound case. And this will really help you out in the beginning of the game when you don't have a ton of knights to cycle through with a lot of different classes at your disposal. As a honorable mention, one thing I will say is make sure you invest points into each requisition thing at least once or else you will not ever receive items whenever you complete a mission so you can see here for the melee requisition it says i will always receive a tier one of a melee weapon but for range i will never receive any until i put points into it so putting this in as early as you can across all five of these requisitions is absolutely a must because this way it will help you get more items more knights more war gear in your game Another fast honorable mention here is for the Medikai Servo Skull. This little guy is one of the strongest war gear items in the game because it will give you a nice long range to heal another one of your Grey Knights. Also, it will purify them. So if they have plague or anything like that, it will remove it. Also, it's immune to autos and ignores cover. So you can target pretty much anyone as long as they're within 10 range. But here's the biggest one, biggest thing that makes it so strong. It only uses ammunition, meaning it doesn't cost an AP to use. So you can use it during your turn, heal one of your Grey Knights, and still continue to do whatever you were going to do. So hopefully these quick tips helped you out in getting into Warhammer 40,000 Chaos Gate Demon Hunters coming out tomorrow. This gives you a nice little way to break down some of those early learning pains at the very beginning of the game and the 10 to 20 hours that you're going to be putting into in the very start to learn a lot of this stuff naturally as always guys thank you so much for watching here go ahead and let me know any other tip tricks tips or tricks that you find out in your foray into chaos gate let it be known in the comment section below i'd like to try to disseminate as much information out there as possible but thank you so much for watching here today make sure you tune in for any of the live streams or future content that we'll be covering for chaos gate in the weeks and months to come I'll be doing a giveaway here on the channel that you can find live streamed tomorrow at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. But thank you so much for watching. Have a good one and take care.